we're back, obviously. The dirt's been shoved back up against the foundation. And, uh, you know, from this elevation to the bottom of the footing is what needs to be at least 12, minimum of 12 inches here in uh, Lane County. You know, in Bend it'd be 18 inches, in Klamath Falls it'd be 24. Something else has to happen with this fill up against the house. It needs to be graded away from the house. Remember, we don't want water congregating at the building. We want it always going away. So it needs to fall a minimum of six inches in the first 10 feet. We're just going to drill the hole and put it down and then we'll cut it off later. Okay. Keep coming, I'll hold Any place against the concrete, it's got to be pressure treated lumber. A dry rot is a fungus. That's what usually deteriorates lumber. The fungus um, needs two things. Something to eat, which is the wood, and it needs uh, moisture. Usually it cannot survive if the wood isn't wet, okay? We assume these, the lumber in these locations is gonna be wet. Therefore, we eliminate it as a food source by putting this uh, icky poison in, you know, in the lumber and eliminate that as a food source for the fungus. Anywhere that we're building on the concrete, put pressure treated lumber against the concrete and build from there. From there on, we can use lumber that is not pressure treated. You might notice that we've put a plastic underneath this plate for the plate. It's to keep the moisture in the ground from getting up into that space and deteriorating the untreated lumber, right? I don't want to put the plastic out now. For one thing, it's not done raining and it would just fill up with water. And we are prepared to roll that out. We'll, we've pinned it down. You know, there's a 16 foot roll here and one here. It's all rolled up, ready to be rolled out later. Um, that will be done after we put the floor joists in, after the plumber is done walking back and forth and tramping around in here. These are pressure treated plates to get bolted down to the top of the foundation. These are the anchor bolts that were installed in the top of the foundation wall. And there, you know, there's rules for where they have to be. There has to be an anchor bolt within the, within a foot of the end of a bore and no closer than seven bolt diameters. These are half inch bolts. So everybody said, oh, it can be no closer than three and a half inches from the end of a bore. That's just to assure that this pressure treated plate is bolted down really, really well. You see these three by three inch by three inch steel plates that are on each anchor bolt? That is really holding this pressure treated plate down. Uh, we're anchoring this plate to the foundation. The house, the home, the sheeting on the outside wall will eventually get nailed into this pressure treated plate. It locks everything in place. The house can't go anywhere without this going with it. We've bolted it down, it isn't going anywhere. Here are the hangers um, into which we're going to vertically place these uh, two by ten. Now there, here's a little story for you. Um, everybody used to use dimensional lumber for, for floors. Uh, well, not everybody, but um, a floor joist. It's a, you know, we're placing them vertically so they're strong. Well, the, the rage these days, or what everybody usually does, is uh, the TGIs, the eye joists. They're very lightweight. It's an engineered wood product. Um, I could get them to go full span here. They're lovely. They're uniform. They're perfect. Uh, they are also very expensive right now. Uh, the last project we did, just for example, I think they were a buck eighty per foot. It's more than doubled. It's almost three eighty something. 
for a, a, just a lineal foot. I have the option of using uh, going back to dimensional lumber, so that's what we did. We're using two by ten. Foot price of two by ten is, but a buck forty, fifty, something like that. Buck forty, yeah. Forty. Okay, so you know, ultimately, it's the same floor. It'll be the same strength. It's just we're going we're going back in the, back in time here a little bit. We're doing what what we used to do. You'll notice that these hangers that we've installed here, the top flange hangers, makes sense. They're they're flan they're hanging on the top, right? There's nowhere to fasten them in the body here. These six nails on the top are what keep this from falling down. The system that they use to pressure tooth this lumber is corrosive to these hangers. You, these are run of the mill, use them um, in any normal situation type hanger. You cannot put them in contact with this pressure treated material. You need to isolate them and we've done that with a little piece of, it's some roll roofing type stuff. You could use tar paper or whatever you wanted to use. Don't get bitten by that. Uh, that is the rule. You have been warned. Uh, I, I warned everybody about that because I had to pull a bunch off. I just totally forgot about it one time. And, you know, it's not as easy to pull these hang hangers on and off with the floor actually in place. It's not as much fun. Than, um... I put some thought into where these floor joists needed to be. Um, there are certain things you need to pay attention to when, when that is your job, to place these floor members. And that probably the most important thing is uh, what cannot move. And one thing that cannot move, there's there's no uh, tolerance for it being some other place, is like the toilet flange. The toilet's got to be where the toilet has to be. I don't want to put the floor joist right where the toilet goes because the plumber would get to there and say, well, what? I can't, you know, he'd get his chainsaw out and start hacking the floor. Uh, our task now is to. Uh, frame the subfloor, everything below the floor, right? There are framing members and uh, floor joists that need to get put in here uh, to create this platform for the building. So here are the, the floor joists of which I spoke last time, and these are a 2x10 uh, Douglas fir floor joists. Um, I can see some are number ones, some are number twos, um, and that's fine. They would have to be a minimum of number two grade material. And it's a fairly reasonably flat surface, and things went pretty well today. And we ran a uh, joist on, on the closest side to me on the left. The joists on the other side are to the right. We did not cut them at all. We just let them over overrun the wall by, I don't know, six inches on each side. Uh, nail, nailed them together. Nailed them to the wall, the cripple wall. Put blocks in between. That's called lateral support. Uh, you have to be careful with these top flange hangers that we talked about. To get the, the, the hanger up against, tight up against the wall when you're putting the joists in there. It's a dramatic effect when when the back of that hanger is allowed to pull away from the wall, it really raises the joist. So uh, we had to move a couple around and um, change them. Obviously the goal is for it all to wind up being nice and flush. And, and for the most part, these floor joists are a tad higher than this, but that's pretty typical actually. It'll all come out in the wash. Nobody will ever notice. We'll just put the plywood on there and call it macro. A uh, pony wall built, a cripple wall. That's just what it's called. It's it, you know supporting the mid span of the floor. Allows us to use a little bit smaller joists. You can imagine how big the joists would have to be if there wasn't any bearing in for them in the middle. You need to vary the length of the the cripples because the footing is never perfect. Sometimes it is. If it were perfect, we'd have come and cut them all all those little cripple uh, studs at the same length and put them in but it's not, they varied, you know, a quarter, three eighths or whatever. So string line, measuring to the string, being fussy about the length of each one to, to make sure that the top of the wall is nice and flat and consistent with the, everything else. The, the little cripple studs underneath there, the, the stud, the, 
studs in that little short wall are lined up with the um, joists. You know, technically, I could have used one top plate on this wall. You can, uh, you probably can't see, but there are two top plates on the wall. Um, when you have two top plates, it allows you to bear uh, a roof rafter or a floor joist or whatever anywhere you want. Okay, I have a couple extra joists in here which were falling in weird places, so I went ahead and put two plates on here. Um, if they, if your bearing is directly over a stud, those are opportunities to li to only use one plate, and that would be an example of, you know, sustainable building. Or to get Tim, uh, the plumber in here next. Uh, the plumber needs to put all their fixtures where they need to go. Basically, they're notching these plates and running pipe that'll end up in the wall. They'll put the toilet flange I talked about, you know, all the plumbing underneath the house. Basically, all of the, the waste lines for the home and then supply supplies for water wherever that's required. Inspector could come take a look at it, but they can't provide a final approval for underfloor framing until the plumbing is done and anything else that has to go in there. Reason being a plumber, uh, not to pick on plumbers, but uh, you know they may need to notch a joist here or there or drill a big hole through one of these supports. And they may drill too big of a hole or put a hole in the wrong place, something that wouldn't be um, structurally sound uh, in the end. So that work has to be done before the framing, underfloor framing will be approved. The goal would be to come back and, and put sheeting on this thing. Um, you know, the, the plywood decking. That We need a place to access the underfloor area. And per Tim's wishes, he didn't want an access from the outside of the building. That's typically what you see. So we're putting access inside the building and we're putting it inside a closet. This is a pretty big closet here. We're putting a hole in the middle of the floor of the closet. What we'll do is we'll sheet right over this. We'll mark out where it is. And we'll cut back you know, halfway onto these uh, framing members. And then we'll cut a piece of plywood that fits right in that hole. Anywho, uh, they're sheeting, uh, they're, they're coming towards me with great speed. I, I'm feeling a need to urgently get this finished up. They're not going to catch me. <laughs> uh, and I'm almost done. I'm heading this out, that's what this is called. This joint can't go to where it needs to go. I'm going to cut it short, run a framing member across the, the front of it, and support it with this header, if you want to call it that. This little pony wall that we built, a portion of it will get cut out to provide enough room to get back and forth.